Hello, everybody. My name is Solimar Salas, and I am a content vice president of Innovation and External Relations at MOLA, Museum of Latin American Art. Today, Wednesday, August 30th, we welcome you to this edition of MOLA Zoom Project. We are having a conversation with Eliazar Ortiz, where Gabriela Ortiaga, our chief curator, will talk to the artist about his work and his career. We are very thankful for the support of the organization Charlotte's for Youth Fund, Miller Foundation, and we also want to give a recognition to California Arts Council and Arts Exposure Grants for their constant support for uh, MOLA's education programs. In order to enjoy this uh, talk, we will have interpretation available. Every participant must choose your language at the bottom part of the screen by clicking on the globe uh, icon and choose your language. Our main language in this session will be Spanish and we will be interpreting into English. In every chapter, when we have a conversation with the artist and our curator, we uh, have the focus in a series of specific artwork that require a more close inspection and more exploration. We want to go deep into the ideas around the creation of the works, their source of research and inspiration so that we can submerge ourselves in the world of the artist. In today's chapter, we are having an interview with the multidisciplinary artist Eliazar Ortiz. Ortiz. His work researches uh, identity, gender identity, violence and equality, as well as the control of the body and the transformation and colonial use of the land. Eliazar Ortiz is born in the uh, Dominican Republic in 1981. He studies civil engineering at the Universidad Nacional Pedro Enriquez in Santo Domingo. However, his interest in art led him to rethink his profession. He moved to Argentina from 2019. 2009 to 2012. He studied photography at EAF in Buenos Aires. There he held his first exhibitions and he participated in the city's underground art movement through anti-racism collectives and LGBTQI plus collectives. In 2015, he settled in Las Terrenas in Dominican Republic and he began working about sustainability in his art practice using natural resources in his environment through the research, through ethnobotany, creating his own pigments and the paper with which he creates his work. He incorporates the environment in his creation. Throughout his career, he has received a different Throughout his career, he has received different awards and grants, among them the prize for CIRD, an honorable mention in the 27th Biennial in Santo Domingo, a residence in the Museum Memorial Acte de Guadalupe, and the grant by CCI of Perez Art Museum in 2021. His work is about different topics like language and the body, the identity, masculinity, climate justice, decolonization and repatriation, as well as the recovery of legacy and the memory of the Afro-Caribbean cultures. I remember, you, I remember, I remind you that you can share your comments in the chat or in the Q and A section of Zoom. And with this, I give you the chief curator of MOLA, Gabriela Urtiaga. Thank you, Solimar, and thank you to all the team at MOLA. Thank you for joining us in this very special chat. Eliazar, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you. Thank you for your generosity, for your time. And we are very happy to be able to continue to disseminate your work and to get to know more about it as well and your commitment as an artist, as an activist. How are you? Doing well, thank you for your invitation. I'm very happy for the opportunity to be able to express myself and talk to you about my art practice. Tell us a little bit, well, we want to know everything, of course, but mainly I'm interested in uh, you introducing us to your artwork and your commitment to the different topics that you've been working on along your career. And also, 
more importantly, as an artist from the Dominican Republic, how it is to be part of that community of artists from the Caribbean and the moment that you're living right now in art in, in the Caribbean. Well, we'll start with the present. Right now, I'm, we're, living in, we're living a very powerful moment in the area of the West Indies and the Caribbean because there's some kind of a synergy of the commitment to create links between the different cultures. This archipelago of different cultures was always separated because of the colonial history and the bureaucrat bureaucracy of the different nations, but that's kind of breaking down. So there's a major interest of having communication among Caribbean among, among Caribbeans. And it's been it's a great moment as an artist because Right now, I am in Borinquen in Puerto Rico, and that also talks about the need to have this dialogue between cultures, because we've always had a lot of things in common. We're one of the large West Indies, and we have a common language, except for Jamaica and Haiti, but Cuba, uh, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico have had a lot of transit of knowledge. And then we're also thinking a lot about the uh, minor West Indies in the case of the Afro culture or the slave descendant culture that I like to call it like that. We are looking at each other to think about how are we going to repair as a group the story that has not been told the right way. So I think this is a very powerful moment to change the narrative and make it more honest a narrative based in art, of course, because there is philosophy, there is history of the Caribbean uh, philosophy, especially the Francophone um, culture that have talked a lot about the Black culture. That's wonderful. And what you say is very true. How to start the discussion from art, because sometimes it's also easier to talk through art, right? about the visibility, the injustice. So tell us what are what inspires you? What are the questions that you translate to your body of work? How is it about re-questioning yourself about the Afro-descendant culture or the Blackness, especially in the Caribbean, through your work? Well, if I start to think about the start of my work as an artist, I started pretty late because my formation really comes from a completely different academic um, tradition, which was uh, engineering. I was I left civil engineering to dedicate myself to art in a more intimate way. It was more about discovering my own identity, my own sexuality, questions about gender, but also in a very personal way for trauma and other situations that are uh, behind. So that also got me to think about self-portrait and masks as a negation of blackness and also migration. That's another theme that we people from the islands have, right? Especially people from Dominican Republic, because the whole migration theme becomes very complex because of social issues, because of mobility, uh, colonization, but I was very lucky to be able to migrate with the awareness of wanting to develop my art. So I traveled to Argentina to study photography. There's the different paths. Paths are so strange because when I left for to Argentina to study photography, what I found was that I wanted to be a performer having the tool of the camera, but looking at a city that complains and goes out to the street to fight. So it's really hard not to get uh, bitten by that um, by that bug, you know? People are going out to to complain and it's hard not to make that your, your own artistic uh, work. So I started doing art in the street as well. That's why I got linked to the underground scene in Argentina because you, as a migrant, you are Caribbean, you're black, and you're, an, you're a migrant, and then you are, there's a queer environment. So it's not about going to a gallery or a museum, right? Uh, that was not the bet I wanted to make 
so there were movements that were um, behind me, you know, backing me up, and it was really wonderful. It was, it wasn't about the work. It was about expressing yourself and complaining and going, you know, to the, to the demonstrations. And that was like the the day thing, you know, the day to day thing in Argentina. That's right. It's kind of in our DNA, right? So places affect us very much, like the surroundings and also the materials in your surround surroundings. I lived in Buenos Aires and the materials there, what was closer to me was plastic. I used to work with uh, scotch tape or, or tape. We call it tapey in the Dominican Republic. And I would take the tape to make masks, to make fonts. And then I also used it in photography, in the performance. So it was a material that was with me. I actually was painting with tape, with sticky tape. So when I went back to the Caribbean, to the Dominican Republic, I wanted to continue with that dynamics. And I realized that it was different because the Dominican idiosyncrasies and the population don't have that feeling or that, that form of going out into the streets to, to fight like they do in Argentina. And they didn't have the, that same Ill impulse. It was more uh, opaque because of the situation over there. So I had to change my dynamic. It was, it was a real shock that change and the transition of going back to the island. But I reconciled with themes like uh, blackness and I left uh, the island. So I was black, you know, that was the first thing that people understood about me. And it was violent at the beginning, of course, because I also had other things. I am a mixed being with a lot of identities behind me, some of them unknown, of course. I've never done a, a DNA test, but my family is very old in Dominicans. But my great grandfather was from such and such a place. You know, I don't know that. All I know is that there are some Haitian um, ancestors and i think there is a mixture of european as well but that was really crazy to go to a place where everything is either black or white it's like a binary population and i am very combative with that because i understand you know and if there's an identity we are all a mixture and if we do archaeological studies studies we are all descendants from africa and i like to think about the slave descendants and to think about reparations that not all of us lived a same situation and some of us may have had families that were enslaved and so my discourse especially right now is to claim for that and to have that reparation done and we should not allow others to tell us our own stories you know to the black to black people it's what you're saying is really interesting because even one of the first works uh, that we wanted to talk to you about is Todes. And I thought that it was very important, this approximation that you do of the of language and body. And this dynamic that you are defining with the historic reparations, but also with the body as a reservoir of trauma and the context. So I chose this photograph, this photograph uh, that I would love, Eliasar, if you could share with us your creative process and the message behind this work. Of course, I'm glad that this is the this is the start of the curator process of, of taking this this photo this photograph because this is a transition. The tool is, is photography, uh, but I am also considering the work of the land. So they call it land art, because this was a work that had me reflecting about our natural environment. And of course, I'm treating the body and the language, because if you see there, that, photogra that photograph is completely intervened with a symbol language that I've been um, giving to it different different meanings inspired by nature. And this takes me as, a, for me, the inspiration is the natural environment. I live in La Terrena, that's where I live and I work. And it's a place that's really close 
to a natural area, forest, but beach as well, is the first time that I'm living in the Dominican Republic where I can also enjoy the coast. So there's a work there of ethnobotany because everything that you see there in the in all that world of plants and ecology, because there's also fungus there and animals, there is a skin of a snake there, there's also some conch um, and some snails. And it's a natural environment, but also so that we can have an answer to the Anthropocene. You know, this thing that the human being is centered right there. And so it, there's the Anthropocene, but there, it's also a being that's kind of pierced by a, by a group of other beings with whom he has a dialogue. So I placed myself at the beginning of that project. It was, I was thinking about mascul masculinity. It was a topic that was really present there for me, but um, curating this and with all the reflection, it ended up being something else in the end. The project ended up being something about recognizing yourself in a moment of crisis, of a climate crisis, where we really should change the way in which we act the environment and at the same time have a dialogue and recognize all the different forms, life forms that surround us, that it's not human. It's not only the humans that are here. And so the shape that I take here is not even a human movement. It's a snake movement, you know? So I'm evoking questions that are more zoo, you know, shapes and Afro as well with the Aboriginal cultures that always have that devotion to the vegetal world and the animal as well. It's very powerful. And after that, we wanted to share the next work, which is uh, from 2020, where you are also working, Wadi Kriol, you're also working with natural pigments on paper. You were working the dance, the body language as a ritual painting that you are exploring through this wonderful uh, scene. But I was also interested in this link that you're making with different practices used by the Caribbeans and the Tainos and where you find in that research, in that interest that you have in these uh, different topics, roots as an act of decolonization and of reaction against these uh, or with the search of liber liberation uh, through the body. Can you tell us a little bit more about this specific work, Eliasar, in about your concept behind this very important series? Yes, this piece was, this, this work, I always have to say that this was be because of a trip I did in Guadalupe. It was a residency that I did in Guadalupe in Memorial Art, and that started to get to know all the stories of the people that were enslaved. This this place has a memory of that. So it was like having an awakening and having to talk about this. So in order to talk about this topic, for me, it's a very difficult topic, so it was better to do it through dancing, through movement. And between Africa and the indigenous uh, cultures, Arawak, Caribbean, and also the Mayan culture, the ceiba is a, is a sacred tree. And it's a tree that is also shared. There's ceiba in Africa in Abayala. So it was really crazy, the fact that I imagine that these people that were enslaved arrived and they found this, this tree in the West Indies. So they were um, dancing to this tree because they're, they're dancing to this seba or silk cotton tree. It's a dance to the tree. And it makes me think about something that continues in contemporary times, which is the ritual and the dance. We see that when people are dancing in the different parts, uh, like Haiti in Waka over here, which is the inspiration of the dancing Guadalupe, I think, 
or you can see it in Los Palos or La Bomba in now, right now that I'm in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, it's not just about enjoying, it's also a ritual. There's a, a there's this thing about um, giving the body. It's a, They are allowing us to let go. When you start the dance, you start that this is also a way of, of letting go. It's a cathartic uh, moment to let go of trauma and a lot of other things. And that's why I didn't even want to use the traditional um, things that you use, the you, traditional costumes, because that is also um, influenced by the colonial history. And that's just something that's made up. So I didn't want to be faithful to those rhythms. and. In this case, it was uh, Gaga and Waka of Guadalupe and from Dominican Republic and Haiti. So the colors that animals have and mushrooms have and people have are also a matter of reivindicating the Arawak culture, which is that part that influences me a lot and the Taino uh, culture, because they are colors that are described like the in the in the different writings they describe the colors that the different indians had they they said they were painted by hawa and vija which are ritual colors which are also important to me in my practice i work with natural pigments and that was also a change working with natural pigments was a before and after because i had to focus more in botany and my latest research work is centered in botany very much. Not so much thinking about like scientific things, but more about metaphors and healing. Because every story behind every pigment brings a story of healing. The Vija works for healing uh, like, uh, like blows, you know, traumatic and it heals your skin and Hawa also helps to uh, scar and it's a diuretic and Hawa is the in the human culture is like the goddess and the mother of all women so there is a whole situation of feminine initiation that I'm very interested in I'm very interested in myths it's a matter of oral tradition which are not just mythological and fantastic they also have a function a usage because this whole thing about pigment has a reason of uh, healing and um, and feeding, you know. So that's important to bring it to the present. All these meanings, Eliasar. It's what you're saying is very interesting, and when I'm looking at your work, we also see that flexibility and that multidisciplinary approximation that you have. So. Now, the next one that I'd like you to share with us is Canoa Co. That's an installation. It's one of your most recent works. And we are just introducing ourselves in the first works that you did. But now I'm also interested in exploring this other part kind of, inter of inter interventions that you're doing in the different spaces with the use of the earth, but also with the reflection that doesn't just talk about a landscape, but also about cultural decisions, economic and political decisions, such as borders between the Dominican Republic and Haiti and that exchange and the influence, and I imagine also certain tension. So here we have the picture of one of your new works and i would lo love it if you could share with us a little more about this new approximation that you're developing thank you every time i see this work because it's so recent sometimes us artists as we if we see like our recent works at least at least me it's it's harder to talk about that because we need to like take more time to reflect and separate yourself from your piece but it's it's something that's um uh, live actually this is in exhibiting guatemala and it's i had that that concern or that desire that started the the wall 
that a separating barrier between Dominican Republic and Haiti, given the new situation of um, social instability in our sister Republic of Haiti. But this is also a very intimate situation because I got to meet Haiti because of the rivers. The river Artibonito, which is the river in the middle. So there's three rivers, part of the three rivers that separate Dominican Republic. There's more, there's a lake as well. So there's the Artibonito, Molito, and the and the river Massacre, or Massacre, Massacre, because that was a, an event during the Trujillo times. And there was a massacre from the Dominican state to the Haitian population. So that river name was changed to massacre because of that historical event. And there's a past there about how Dominican Republic was, was formed. So to give you all the context of the tension of this situation, we need to understand that the Dominican independence was not from Spain, it was from Haiti. That's a very particular situation between those two nations and of the colonial heritage that has left a very particular situation in an archipelago that has two nations with similar roots because there's a whole history that joins us, but there's different cultures, linguistic and, um, and uh, mentality uh, differences. So I, I think there's a lot of separations. Language is a very important separation uh, it's not something that's disseminated in, in schools. They don't uh, teach you Haitian because that's the question of the otherness. It, it, it's seen as a different culture, even if even though there's a lot of influence in our day to day life, because we have a, a very large um, migration from from Haiti and there's a lot of tension in the border. So creating a wall is adding tension, not only human, but environmental as well, because a lot of the resources used for that uh, wall is natural resources from the environment and that uh, area that they are um, putting down the mangles. So that whole crisis situation of the environment over there is something that affects me deeply because my work has been dedicated a lot to climactic justice. and. I am also thinking about the dynamic that are the dynamics between a lot of uh, animals there that is um, affected a lot when you build a, a wall and a fence and that starts giving way to you know people trafficking happening in a in a greater way because right now with Haiti's situation the situation of uh, human trafficking has trafficking has gotten worse to uh, Dominican Republic and in Haiti because it's a very complex situation this uh, thing about neo slavery so these rivers I am also thinking about them in terms of uh, material syncretism because the material there is like clay and sand from the river and the ocean but I'm also using fibers that were the ones uh, being used in the plantations in the like in the places where people were enslaved and working so with the evolution of plantations the system of um, mono crops uh, started um, appearing so you can see uh, there is cotton and saba again this this tree because i also work with that fiber thinking about this ritual thing um, in the indigenous and afro cultures with the saba I presented this in Guatemala and it turns out that Seba is also a sacred tree in the Mayan culture and I really like that because a lot of the materials that we work with in the installation were in collaboration with Esperanza Chacon. She's from the community of Chinatla in Guatemala and that's a community that has three rivers as well. There's a there are three rivers there and they have a terrible situation there in terms of climate crisis. There's a a horrible stress there to the to the water with the content with the pollution and contamination so i was invited to that community and the problem is not just the borders with people but the situations that the rivers have that's a very sad situation right now and looking at that and seeing that we have a common common history you know it's a global problem and sometimes we have that you know insular 
mentality that we think we are the only ones with the problem but then when you go to the other to other lands you can see that the problem is everywhere and that's very sad that's right it's global so how was the reception of your work when you are presenting all these um topics also with the political idea of calling to reaction as community in different countries well, it's really crazy because sometimes when there's an, when I was in Guatemala, there were many different reactions and people go, you know, to the poetry over there and also for think or see the beauty, right? Which is strange because the part of those balls with cement, those symbols are symbolize the river. They symbolize, uh, in my language, that it determines the river. But when I think about that river, especially the Artibonito and Masacre and the, Re and the Molito River, they are beautiful rivers. I always have this memory of beauty. And that's how, when I met Haiti, my dad um, had me on his rivers through the river to the Haitian part. So I have those memories. It's a poetic memory. And uh, I thank nature for those places where I didn't really understand about these identity things or, you know, nationality things. But when I went to Guatemala, people saw the river, saw, I see the river, I see the garbage, and I see a completely different um, panorama of how you can see the river. And, you know, this, I'm not, I'm, I'm also presenting here the beauty that I would love. I would like to for things to remain like this, the natural way. And people see beauty, but then that brings them pain. Because with the colors, I'm also trying to bring that, like with the Massacre River, it's a brown river. And all the other, there's also the part of the movement there, well, you see the red clay there, that curve, is that past, past that massacre uh, that was done from the Trujillo dictatorship uh, in Dominicana against the Haitian people. So I like symbols with colors, and that's why I also work with uh, this thing of symbols and colors. We have a lot, which have a lot to do with Dominican voodoo, uh, with the Dominican and Afro and West Indies culture. There's a lot of different divisions. And the whole history of uh, voodoo and their 21 divisions has the history of color because every law, every saint, every maitresa has a color that represents them. So that's also why I like to include color. And there is other uh, also artistic um, beliefs that are more global like Glenda. Well, the next uh, work that we have here is Luaco Coye, which is wonderful. Of course, the result is a photogra photograph, but you are here also exploring performance and you are including through objects and the rich riches of nature, the, the what this body is wearing and there's this mask as well and certain negations that you want to express in this piece. Can you tell us a little more and also the use of materials and the references to coconut that you're using to create to create this garment with the fibers. And also this that the the topic that you've been talking about, this negation of blackness in many institutions as an ideological decision of certain places where you are placing that focus there um, through your creation. Yeah, that's true. That's the start of uh, creating a piece like Luacocoye is the weight that we have of a situation, which is how we represent ourselves, you know, the negation where it's based on how we've been raised, how we've been colonized, because there's a negation of blackness and that's very institutional because I don't consider that the Dominican rep uh, people doesn't know that they are descended from uh, Africa or, or, or slaves. I think there's a, there's a shame that is not accepted. You know, the majority of us are black, but 
but we are really not seeing or saying that we're children of slaves and that's very hard if it doesn't come along with you know a lot of baggage and uh, tools for education and it should be supported by the state and institutions but not just state institutions i think also institutions like church there's a lot of repression from the catholic and evangelical and protestant uh, church to afro expressions like voodoo like gaga like many other expressions that are more like afro and that they come it's not that they are um alien to catholicism these uh religions also have some catholic saints but these institutions, these religious institutions are not interested in the people's expression of their Afro descendants or their blackness. There's always a conflict in during the Holy Week and we have the rituals and processions of Gaga, which are more frequently in the Bateyes, in the Bateyes area of the island. There's always a conflict, an ideological conflict, and they are not allowed. They don't want to allow them. That was very recent, and that doesn't come from the state as such. It comes from institutions as the Catholic and evangelical churches. And evangelical churches uh, have black people too. They're not white in their majority. There's also a black population. It's a crazy contradiction, and that's the negation again. So that's the mask. So I like the coconut as an analogy because coconut is not a native plant to the West Indies. And possibly there that um, the way it was introduced, it, 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 it just traveled on its own, it expanded. I don't like to use the word colonized, but you know, it changed the, the landscape in the coast of a lot of areas in the island. Then the element of the coconut, I like to think about, um, like in the area where I live, the area where I live is based a lot in the coconut, the, the bread, the food, the, the candy, all about the coconut is present there as a very strong culture. And it's, a, it's something that was invented, you know. Um, I'm not initiated in voodoo and any other religion. I don't like to take directly, you know, a saint or or a, or a maitresa. I like the 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 act of inventing things myself. So kokoye is coconut in Haitian Creole, and they are like the gods or the spirits uh, that connect in voodoo, like maitresas. Those are the feminine spirits. In, um, in Dominican Haitian voodoo. voodoo. So um, I'm glad that you mentioned this because even though this is a, a still photograph, it comes from an action. It's a photograph, but I'm glad that you mentioned that. I see it more as a performance, as an action, and that's what it is really. Yes, it's wonderful. And you know, while you were talking, um, I'm really grateful about everything you're sharing and your activism is very powerful and very necessary as well. And with that dichotomy that you are expressing before that rediscovery of the body and of an identity that was uh, submitted and promoted by certain institutions, but there's also a cultural work that is going to take time that will take time to be able to talk about things like these traumas these negations so the access that you're allowing us through your work to continue to reflect and question and rethink these new terminologies that have been there for centuries it's but it's always great to be able to have access to a different reflection to a, a way of looking at the present to be able to change something as a community. The next piece that I am interested in is Safra Lovers from 2020. And here is also very important because you actively you're actively working on that rebellion that happens in the body that in intimacy as a decision as an intimate 
decision, but also a political one. So I'm interested in reflecting on the different layers of messages that you're giving us with, with your work, especially talking about that continuous repression of the LGBTQ community. I'm glad that you're showing this piece because when we think about reparations, I also like to think about, even though they were very far away events that happened, like this was the first rebellion of an enslaved uh, people in the island. It was one of the first ones that happened from the enslaved peoples in the Americas. The rebellion of Boca de Niwa, it was an event that happened in a um, sugar cane um, plant uh, more than three centuries ago, a processing plant. and. I, it's important that we tell these stories through the arts because it's really crazy. Gabriela, the history books of Dominican Republic, at least in the last century, those things weren't told, you know? Those stories of rebellion like uh, Silmarón Ángel uh, were there, but they were never talked about in depth in the classroom. So every, because every time they talked about it, if we went to the, through the different layers, they were going to show the privileges that the white minority has in the Dominican Republic. And they're not interested in that story being told because it continues with the colonial story. I think that after the European colonization, uh, the colonizers in these areas continued with that mentality so that they didn't lose their privileges. So if you're not informing the indigenous and black communities about the movements of a rebellion or of um, how to manage the, the situation after uh, the end of slavery, that's also violence because it's a way of keeping people ignorant. I knew about this story a year before I did this piece, when an anthropologist, Fatima Puerto Real, talked to someone in the community in Nigua about that event. And I was very interested, and it was the first event of rebellion. So everything happened because of, an, because of a homosexual act. And of course, if you don't tell the story of blackness well, the way it should be, of course they're not going to tell story if what triggered the event was a situation where we're talking about gender, about how there was a movement where most of them were men in the plantations, in the case of the sugarcane uh, plantations, where there was a homosexual relation between two uh, enslaved uh, people, Benito Sopan, the other one was Francisco, with one of the um, with one of the head people and they killed one of the slaves and people thought that was the last straw. And then the, re the rebellion happened and it really hurt in that moment uh, because the all the colonize uh, all the colonizers in the in that plantation were killed. But it was very, uh, it was a whole ritual thing. There was a coronation of the leader of the rebellion, Ana Maria. She proclaimed herself a queen. So there was a whole ritual party with her coronation. And I was also interested in talking, going back to colors, because it was about the things that were planted there. The the anil, that's the blue uh, stripe that you see there. The indigo, you also see, I can also see it in the area where I live. And you can see the bodies of Benipo Isopo with the cotton. We also have the nigua leaf, which is the the brown pigment there behind the, the cane and the machetes as well. And we have the flower of the African tulip, which is also a very controversial tree in Puerto Rico also because it's considered an invasive species, species that tree, but it has a very good brown pigment. We also have the, the butterfly uh, wings that's covered the machetes. It's if that when we hunt them, it's when they're eating the tree of the guanamana fruit. So I'm very interested in telling stories with the materials, right? I don't have a, an academic formation as a painter, a plastic formation. My, my works are very simple. My drawings are very simple. There's nothing too elaborate. 
but I think materials help me tell the story. So I'd rather have the materials to have the strength in the narration and movement as well. When I do, when I make a drawing with two bodies of two men having a homosexual relation, I'm trying, pretending to transgress with that I, and to make it un uncomfortable, but also to create empathy to whoever wants to see themselves reflected in a narrative where we don't see ourselves. I want to see a story where I see myself having a good time as well in terms of homosexuality. Of course, it's necessary, of course, Eliasar, yes it is. And thank you for sharing that because we could keep on talking for hours and hours, but time, time flies, as you well know. So I wanted to invite Solimar and, and Daniel to open up uh, the moment for questions with the audience. We had selected as a closing work, your video installation which is also Mahawa Amaguana is one of your more recent works. So while we uh, wait for Soliman and Daniel to uh, join us, we'll start to watch uh, some of the video and then we'll go on with the questions. Thank you for the talk, and it's been wonderful to see everything you're working on and also to learn a little bit more about our neighboring island. For those of you in the audience that don't know, I am from Puerto Rico. So you really never stop learning in this life. So if anybody has a question, anyone in the audience, Patricia Grasales, how's the internal process when you're working on the topics of identity and behavior in nature. So how does it feel to find in other places conflicts or common realities? What is the, what's the effect that those discoveries leave in you as Eliasar? Well, thank you, Patricia. She's a friend, she's in this video actually, and we've worked together. I think that the, well, the first part in terms of the process of observation and contemplation, the work with nature is based a lot in silence. Actually, I have to immerse myself where I am there in a natural environment, watching, observing and asking for permission as well. Because when you go up to the mountain, you need to understand that you have a commitment to the materials. When I think about the materials, I have this idea about what I'm using, but not just for the human element, you know, how how does this work for me, but also how you interact with all these other, how these other elements of nature interact among themselves. And I'm interested in that, in observing like what, what a bird eats or how it sings and how plants start, you know, intertwining with another one and entering a different ecosystem. Um, ecology is a wonderful theme to me because it's a, wonderful process to see. Um, so it's all about contemplation and observation. And it also works for me in terms of healing, because you think about art, but also you can be selfish, you know, and think about how you can heal yourself from different situations that you live. In the pandemic, you know, I'm very grateful because what helped me the most 
was to work with natural pigments because in that process of research and recollection or actually of, of gathering you you are outside of you know that human drama as as the only situation you can you can live you are also looking at how other beings live so you take but you also have to be aware of um not making a mistake you know so that's why I don't like to do works that require a lot of materials. I like doing things that are more simple so that I can be conscientious about working with these materials. And that's a great learning that I've had from working with natural materials. The fact of being more responsible with the materials that I work with and be grateful that the materials that I work with, like ethnobotany, are the ones that give me the stories. They, they give me the, the concepts in my work. So that's a conscience, the 370. It's not just your moment, your experience, right? At that, in that now, it's about how that how that has a, an effect. I had a question as well. It's very interesting to see that you started your formal education as an engineer and you did a, a whole 180 change. Do you think it's a 180 or do you see yourself referring to those academic moments and sometimes in, you know, not completely aware about that? Do you see that has an impact in your career right now? Well, my partner says no, <laughs> I don't have anything to do with engineering. But I think in parts, yes, uh, when where it comes to research, I think there are some processes that are more like that, more academical, more about experimenting. Um, I've been working a lot with techniques like the uh, Adobe that's uh, made in the south of the island. And I'm also thinking about materials with like material resistance or things like that. But uh, even though my affirmation lately is more holistic, I think that I allow myself uh, to play because what I like is to have fun with my work because I have a, I really have a great time drawing and, you know, I'm not very rigid or academic like engineering would be, you know, it requires precision. So no, I, I don't do that because I don't have a academic formation in art. So I allow myself to do, you know, trial and error and, not to be completely exact, but I think, yeah, there's some awareness about engineering because I studied that for a long time and I like numbers a lot. I like to study uh, the different soils and I like physics that are things that you don't forget, you know, and photography. I've always said that it's very uh, with science because you have mechanical and chemical processes and you need to know about angles and light and it's not um, too far, you know, science and art complement each other. Well, with that, very, very specific because Gabriela is working with lots of projects that have a lot to do with that. I'll give uh, back the mic to Gabriela. There are no more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eliazar. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a luxury to be able to talk to you and to spend our day today with you. So we'll keep in touch. Thank you. I'm very, very happy to be able to talk about my work and to have the work, you know, visible. And I'm very happy because I can see that the world is just like a backyard. We're here, there, and we can talk, uh, thankfully, in, in Spanish and talk about themes that are common as well, because it can sound like it's some far away land but our story is the same and it's really nice and and wonderful to see that it's not an individual topic it's a it's a global thing and we need to see how to heal and that'll help us to reflect and that's what's important about art for me reflection thank you very much Eliasar, and thank you everybody for joining us today thank you so from the museum as uh, we thank you all and we'll wait for you for our next uh, chapter for MOLA Zoom projects at the end of September. And
and we will see how things go in the month of September. To those of you in the US, happy start of the uh, celebration of, his, or of Hispanic culture. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.